I feel so distant. <laughs>
Is there two? All right, come on in. This is the only panel you'll go to where we're concerned that this is a cardioid mic that I'm talking into, but. All right. I've been directed by Morgan to go ahead and get started, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna allow the panelists to introduce themselves. First, I'll give you a brief um, synopsis of how this panel, the genesis of this panel. My name is Dave Tuff, and I teach production at Belmont in Nashville. I also run a production company where I do uh, song-based uh, sync songs. I've been doing that for about 15 years. And really, we wanted to focus on, especially the independent composers, producers. You have a given budget. Um, obviously, nowadays, you can do everything yourself. But at what points do you delegate? At what points do you try to do everything yourself, you know, relying on these nice tools we have today like Isotope and you know this program that's gonna master my song, things like that. But also, if you have a limited budget, are you gonna pump out you know, four or $5,000 masters or should you shoot for you know, keeping your budget at a couple thousand dollars and really trying to focus in on certain elements and, and doing them themselves? So we'll talk about workflow. Of course, if you all have questions about the technology, we'll get into DAWs and preamps and microphones. I don't know how much down the tech rabbit hole you want to go, but that's up to you. We'll kind of follow along with the questions. But without further ado, I would like the panelists to introduce themselves. And we'll start from left to right, I guess. However, or stage left. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, well, David, because I'm a Dave and you're a David. Well, let's do it that way. There, there can only be one David. So uh, my name is David Dykstra. I live in Nashville. Um, I toured for about eight, nine years and then started getting into writing and production and really I started um, doing production music after I, I was producing uh, basically backing tracks for bands uh, while I was on the road and, uh, and then I started producing demos and, and EPs and I still do that now and I started doing production music because I'd I'd book a band in Nashville for a three-hour session, and we might have one song to do for an artist, and I'd have all this phenomenal band. And so I was like, well, I'll just write a bunch of you know, country cues, and the bands are phenomenal, and I could have a, a, a great session band knock out you know, six or eight cues in, in you know, two hours. Um, and so I feel like I'm, with the quality versus quantity, I'm getting Nashville band major, you know, commercial recording studio, but I'm knocking out eight cues in, in two or three hours and just letting them, you know, do their creative thing. And then that kind of built into, you know, seeing where my uh, success as far as cues, which, which cues are landing, which ones weren't, I ended up uh, building into, you know, doing a lot of promo work for sports. And so that's really what I'm doing now is, you know, as a drummer and percussionist, I do a lot of um, you know, heavy beat, heavy drums, you know, very high energy stuff, that work, which works well for promos, a lot of live brass. So I'm, I'm big into using, you know, the talent that I have in Nashville and, and drawing those, those people in to really make phenomenal sounding projects. Um, and then I'm not spending a bunch of time trying to sound like a good trumpet player. I just hire a good trumpet player and let them do their thing. And then I've got an authentic project and they got a gig and the library's happy because they have live brass. Everybody's happy. Everybody wins in that circumstance. So, you know, produce projects. I write about five, six albums a year. And um, let's see, what else? I do drum tracks, you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah, that sums it up. Uh, Sarah, I think we're ne you're next. Hi, I'm Sarah Scarlatta. Um, I am also a drummer. There's a lot, of, a drummers lot of drummers here. Up here. You can make a lot of noise. Uh, I went to Berklee College of Music. Um, I was a touring drummer in a bunch of rock bands. Uh, I was having the time of my life, and then I realized uh, I was not getting out of the van, and my band broke up. I started working in a recording studio called Firehouse Recording Studios in 2006, and uh, they owned um, a company called Five Alarm Music and a bunch of other music branding companies, and I really found my passion for production music at that time and learned more about music supervision. So I worked at Five Alarm for eight years, and during that time I was a producer and I wrote uh, albums as well uh, of my own music and found a passion for recording my own stuff, which was really liberating in many ways. 
Um, and then I continued on to 411 Music Group, and I'm currently at APM Music. I'm a music director, and we work with some of the best catalogs around the world I've, I learn every day from, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So that's my life. Steve. <laughs> Hello. I am Steve Shebby. I am an in-house composer and a creative director at Five Alarm Music, and actually have a pretty similar path in life as both of these fine panelists. Um, I grew up playing in bands. I was in a number of signed bands. I did a lot of touring and then went on to work a lot as a side, uh, side musician working in, with for other artists. And then in 2011, I moved to LA uh, with the intention of getting into music production and songwriting. And that's when I uh, got a position with a well-known pop music producer songwriter and worked for two years. Like I was working 14 hours a day, seven days a week, just cutting my teeth, learning so much. And then after that, I got a publishing deal out of that and was writing to pitch for artists for a couple years. And I started getting my music into a lot of TV shows and I noticed, hey, this performance royalties is really cool. Maybe I should pursue that more and started looking around for opportunities in that world, and that's when I found my job at Five Alarm. At Five Alarm, I'm writing 20 albums plus a year and overseeing all of our custom work. Um, so I definitely have a lot to say about quantity versus quality and how to balance that. Yeah, yeah. cool. Okay, Emily. Hi, guys. Um, I was not in a band. Um, <laughs> say that there. Um, my name is Imani Matthews. I own a company called Blaze Unlimited. It is a creative music agency. It has two sides, but the side we're talking about now is more so on our sync side. Um, I also do music supervision and music clearance, et cetera. So I started off at Sony ATV um, at Extreme Music for about two years, got poached um, by Rostrum Records and created their production music library. We created it from scratch. It was urban music. Took about six to seven weeks to do it, so I definitely understand on how to make quality music in a short amount of time with a short amount of budget. Um, and then I did some music supervision for Kevin Durant and Victor Oladipo's um, In the Water, it's on Showtime. And then after that, I started my company, so that's why I'm here now. Um, we do a lot of custom work, a lot of theme songs. I represent different composers and different artists and independent artists specifically um, for sync opportunities. Our clients range from indie films to Condé Nast to Lion Gates and Disney, et cetera. Um, it's about, this is our second year now and we really found our niche in custom work. So that's why I'm here um, because we really know how to make the budget speak for ourselves and land placements. Great. Well, as you can see, we have some amazing panelists here. I'm excited. So the first thing I wanted to kind of talk about is the pre-production process, you know, because obviously if we're making a recording, we have to have a goal. What are we trying to achieve? So the genesis of your projects, and uh, Amani, we can start with you and then work down. Are you looking at certain briefs that come in? Are you, are you trying to stay ahead of trends? Like it was fascinating what you were telling me about some of the African artists you're working with. Um, how do you know what's coming next? Build it and they will come, or are you writing the briefs and then all of that? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I'm a mixture of both. Um, we're known for having music that sounds like it's going to be on the radio right now um, from independent artists who are thriving or striving to be bigger artists um, that are actually really, really good that we all vet through. Um, so I make sure that we have music that is in the now, but for the custom work, it's a lot of briefs. It's a lot of word of mouth, like, oh my gosh, I heard you did this theme song. Can you come do like a um, spec for us? Can you come do this demo for us? Let us know if this makes sense. And it's usually because they're either on a tight turnaround time, because we do 48 hour turnaround, um, or it's because they know the quality that they're going to get, and or it's because they know that the indie artists that we're using really, you know, deserves the opportunity and they know we're gonna vet through them. So I'm a mixture of both. Um, but as far as like making sure that we're in the now, that also means me 
giving like an olive branch to other um, regions. So that's why I represent different catalogs in Trinidad and Tobago. And I represent Maven Records, which has like Tila Savage and Lottie Poe, et cetera. So I do that specifically so that they don't miss the opportunities because there's other people who are making sound alikes for Afro pop, Afro beat, but then you have people who are authentically um, just looking for that opportunity. So I try to give that to them. That's great, and, and one more question for you and then we'll move down because I think this ties in, but when you get the brief or you get the custom work, are you given a budget to pay your musicians because obviously we're talking about production and how to save costs, or is it kind of something in your mind where like I'm not going to go over 3K on this, on this master? Honestly, it depends. It depends on who is giving me the brief. Sometimes we've had demo fees. They're like, hey, we need you to come up with something. We only have like $1,500, can you do this? And I'll be like, cool. I'll go to like one of my 100 percenters um, that I feel like can, 100 percenter to me is someone who records themselves, someone who knows how, who has the vocals or the tone that I'm looking for, someone who writes as well and can send it to me, a nice rough. And then my co-founder, who's an engineer, he mixes it down, make it sound real pretty, and then we send it off. Um, but I go to them because we have a better workflow that way. I don't have to go to multiple people. But then sometimes, like we did a, we did a um, Walt Disney brief for their parks. It was Walt Disney Resorts, and they wanted like a children. Um, choir, like singing this song. It was a great big beautiful tomorrow and they wanted it from kids. So what we did was we took the demo fee, paid the kids per hour um, that came in, paid the studio, the engineer, and we just literally took the fee to just give to them, knowing that if we landed it, once we did land it, um, we were gonna get a percentage of that, that fee, of that sync fee, so. We have a process. We try to be as fair as possible because everybody in our company are also artists or creatives. Sure. And Steve, how about you? I mean, being in-house, it may be a little bit different, but are you, are you getting briefs on a daily basis? Are you given a budget? Um, how do you decide how to allocate resources in the studio and otherwise? Yeah, so there's definitely a wide range of situations, but one of the cool things about working as an in-house composer is I get to collaborate with and lean on our music directors who every day are fielding tons of music search requests. So one of the reasons they brought me on in the first place was to help flesh out the library continuously with the trending sounds that are, you know, there's always a change, what's new, what's hot. Yeah. So for the most part, it's, uh, you know, trying to stay ahead of the curve, but I've also noticed a trend that the, the curve seems to be like there's a slight delay in production music than what's actually going on in real music, so as long as we're doing stuff that's currently hot, I feel like that trend lasts for about two years mm -hmm. in the requests, and then you know we're on to the next thing. And I'm gonna use some dirty words here, like, like royalty-free samples, splice, arcade. Um, are you going there? Are you trying as best as possible to avoid all of that? Or if you do get something from a service like that, are you making it your own by distorting it, pitch shifting it, all of that? I mean, that, that's another question for everyone, but you can address that. I fully you. support using whatever tools available to make the dopest shit possible. <laughs> but that being said, I would completely avoid using any ubiquitously known splice loops. So if I'm using stuff from splice, I won't click on the most popular way to sort through it because I have noticed a good tool to do would be to take the loop, play it, and shazam it because yes. there are a lot of splice loops that, are, that have been put into well-known songs and if you're not the first one to register it and it gets placed in something and that gets put onto YouTube or gets put online, it can get flagged with a uh, royalty infringement. Yeah. So... Um, in general, whenever I use something like that, I'm always flipping it, changing the key, changing the pitch, chopping it up. But, you know, get creative with it. Great advice. And uh, as far as budgets, are you, um, yeah, I mean, as far as, uh, do they give you numbers or you just kind of stay within a certain parameter? And, or do you do it all yourself? Maybe you just do it all yourself. Um, for writing for the library, I do everything myself and I, and I like to collaborate with 
different vocalists and artists that I have relationships with, and I'm always looking for new artists to bring into the fold, and especially to, you know, to capture real authenticity and, and just new flavors. It's, I'm always looking to collaborate with, with fresh artists. Um, that being said, you know, there's a parameter within budget-wise that we're doing at Five Alarm on all the in-house stuff, and then when we get freelance, or if we get a, like custom work, it's always, you know, it's all, those are a wide range of budgets that we work with. Obviously, it depends on the genre. If it's an orchestral thing, it's going to be more expensive. If it's a hip hop track, it could be we could be doing it a lot more. Yeah, affordable. and that's a whole other rabbit hole I want to go down. Is like when you're the children's choir. Are we actually? Are you going to a, a major studio, or, or you know, is it in someone's house? It's just all. It's very interesting. But we'll yeah, we'll get there. So, uh, uh, Sarah, uh, how about yourself on, on the pre-production budgets? Um, all yeah, I, I think um, the first thing I wanted to say is that client needs will always dictate a brief, always. Um, and, and what's cool about being a music director at APM, I do between 10 and 25 searches a day. And uh, not only that, but I see everything that the rest of the team's doing. We have five MDs on the team. So um, that will always dictate what we're going to uh, put our resources toward. And um, so I think that number one, I think all of us in this room need to really be aware as to what people need, you know, because you can make the best thing and spend 20 grand on it and then it doesn't go anywhere. Um, I'm a fan of doing evergreen recordings, like what you were saying, children's choir, that doesn't age out. If you're doing splice and stuff, that's, that has a shelf life, right? And uh, the, the rule of thumb for production, in my experience, was you have to make the money back within two to three years, and that even puts in... Uh, you know, you don't get paid for up to a year sometimes with some of the major networks and everything. But even with all that into play and, and then the three quarters of royalties, you're supposed to make the money back within two to three years. Um, and so, but that works out for like the pop albums that are maybe, you know, uh, less expensive to make but yield a higher profit in the beginning. But if you're doing like a jazz record, a cocktail jazz record, that's a slower process where maybe you won't make the money back in two to three years, but you'll be earning on that forever. So I think it's important to kind of look at both of the both of that that side of the equation. If you're using live instruments um, and not putting too many heavily heavy effects on it, it'll have a longer shelf life. But also, a lot of the new stuff like hip hop and pop really do rely on a lot of technology. So, but that's why you need to be quick about it, like what Steve was saying, like being on top of those those genres ahead of, and being ahead of the curve if you can, so you can actually yield the the profit on the uh, the investment quickly. Great, the great answers. And David, we were kind of joking about Nashville saying like, you know, and, and we, we have so many amazing musicians there, we just feel like you know, we're, we're executive producing, we're just putting the right people together and you get the right people together in a room and it just happens, right? But can you tell us a little bit about your production process um, and, and how that works, how you're recruiting musicians? And I'm especially interested in Nashville because again, if, if you're getting all these live musicians, again, how are you controlling costs? Um, are you getting work for hires from everybody? I mean, again, that's a given, but I think it needs to be said in this room, you know, that that's something that we need to consider as well. So all the, the whole process. Hello, is this thing on? Oh, there we go. Uh, yes, the, and the answer to that is, is pre-production and planning, 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 because if you don't have a good plan and you hire, you know, a handful of people at like 125 an hour, and you just kind of go in the studio, like you're gonna blow a bunch of money really fast. So um, I go in like a, like a surgeon, and I've, I usually, I'm a big fan of uh, getting somebody else's hands on my project. And what I mean by that is like, I've done, I've done a bunch of projects where I do the entire thing from writing it, you know, re recording it, mixing it, mastering it, but I really prefer to get somebody, whether it be a mix guy or uh, an arranger, like an arranger goes a long way, like really, really to improve your project or another player, somebody to just draw on because it, it just keeps my creative juices going. So I love when I can bring in, like if I'm, if I'm doing something that involves either strings or brass, like I always, even though I can write, I can write brass parts, I can do finale, I can do all that. And I think it's great to have all those skills because a lot of times you don't have the budget to bring somebody else in. But I definitely think that the investment is worth the cost, even if you're not given a great budget up front to draw on somebody's expertise. Because um, the decisions made by a, an arranger that, you know, that's their whole job, that might save you, 
you know, if it saves you 15, or 15 minutes in a session, well, you're, you're spending like eight to $10 a minute. Well, they just saved you like 150 bucks in the studio because of their expertise of doing the parts just right and making it look just right so that the players understand it. So I think planning is a huge part of that. So plan, 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 because that will, that will lead to better quality. Because if you get into a hot mess in the studio and everyone's just kind of looking at you like, what, you know, they're just waiting for you to tell them what to do, and they're phenomenal players. So if, if they have clear charts and clear instruction and they've got good pre-production to work with, they'll fly through the material. Yeah. And so are you doing MIDI mock-ups or all of the above? Like, I mean, At, obviously in Nashville, we're so used to seeing the charts, and I don't know, for certain genres, it doesn't lend themselves to that, but um, anything yeah. else to speed up that process? A, a lot of the projects I do end up being 150 plus tracks. So there's a lot of, and I don't like to show anything to anybody that doesn't sound done. So when I show it to a library uh, or a music director that I'm working with or even a co-writer, I like it to sound at least pretty much done. And I just, I don't like showing, because I just want it to sound great. So even my demos, I try to make sound phenomenal. If it's, you know, fake instruments that are intending on re replacing later, I try to make everything sound really great. Um, and then that translates, like if you're, if you're writing all your parts and then, you know, you, you just hand off the MIDI to the arranger guy and his job is pretty easy at that point because, you know, so great sounding demos that could be used without the outside instruments is great because... They're just taking it to the next level. Yeah, they're yeah. just taking it up a notch. You know, and I found, uh, if I can continue just for one second, that I, I've, I've kind of followed the if you build it, they will come mentality. So especially when I was first starting out, I think what really helped me get projects with some of the bigger companies is like, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to invest, you know, a few thousand dollars in a project that I believe in. And then when I show it to somebody at a, you know, a major company, it sounds done because it is done and they don't have to use their imagination. And then I don't have to prove myself because it's already, it's right there. It's like, well, there's the project, you know, do you want it or not? And so, um, you know, there's definitely... I, that's kind of been my, my game plan. And now that I've built those relationships through PMC and other places, like we have more of a open dialogue as far as, hey, what's the next project? Like, what are you guys looking for? But I had to kind of prove myself before I could get to that point because you got to be able to deliver on your, your promises. That's great. So I want to move to tracking now, kind of follow the linear flow. I'm not sure if it happens that way anymore because we always seem to mix when we track nowadays. But tracking, so... Um, Amani, I'm going to come back to you because you were saying you have these 100 percenters that you can send it to. So obviously you're trusting that they have a great signal chain of microphone, preamp. Number one, I mean, this is even before we know that they can sing, right? And they have a great, and they, you know they're going to track it in a home facility, whatever, where there's isolation and all that. I mean, are those relationships built? How do you vet these people? How, I mean, it's so important yeah. nowadays. Or maybe even like an African project where you're or yeah, sending no, it to Africa I've, or India. I vet everybody who I work with. Yeah. Um, I am very blessed to be working with amazing independent artists that has either been doing this for a long time. Um, like one of one of my 100 percenters, his name is um, KY Almighty, or he goes by TK the Legend now. And he, by himself, can make a track, can engineer it, but he had about 10 years of being in the LA studio surfing, engineering. So like he knows how to engineer, he knows how to make things sound really, really good. He's been nominated before. So it's like those type of people who, the masses may not know them, but I've been introduced to that I'm able to go to and say, hey, can you do a custom track for me? But I do vet everybody, um, and I only use the people who are within the catalog already. So if I've already asked for music from you, I already know the quality of music that you can do. I already know your tone, sure. and then I keep that in the back of my head. And then if I get a brief or a request of something that's basically what you could produce, I go straight to you. So everything I do is very targeted. Um, How do you control the tracking process? Again, are you doing remote sessions where you want to actually kind of guide the vocal? Or no, I don't. I give them the brief. I give them an explanation. And I feel like I've been getting the best product when I give the artists creative control. 
Um, and if I feel like they're not going to nail it, then I give it to two or three different, I will call them production teams, wow. um, that, you know, I'll get about 10 selections for custom work in the next 48 hours, go through those, choose the best three, send that to my client. And that's how we've been landing stuff because I don't, put all my eggs in one basket unless they've had the track record to really land placements. So are they, I'm sorry, I'm just I lo, this is yeah. fascinated. Are they top lining the same track or are they coming for everything from scratch? So, okay, so like the theme song we just did for Zatima, um, which just premiered yesterday, um, we had three producers produce tracks, um, put those inside of a Dropbox, sent those to my 100 percenters, and they were able to choose which track they wanted to do. So I already pre-vetted the track. These tracks I know for sure is the style that they were looking for is exactly what I was kind of gauging it to be. I already talked to my producers. Now I'm going to talk to my writers and talk to the people who I know have the tone of what they were looking for. I even did, uh, I even had a remote session happen between one of my artists, Gabrielle Heights, and our and Armani White, um, who right now is like really big for Billie Eilish, the song. Um, and I had them do something to the same track that actually got landed, but unfortunately they didn't make the cut, you know? So it, it, it's all about whether or not they're really taking on the vision and, the, and what exactly this brief is saying. And I, and I guide them as much as possible, like give them notes. We do drafts the first day and then they come back with the second draft and then I send it off. So I just love the 48 hours thing. I, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's great. made us a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, That's great. I mean, you can promise that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Steve, um, from your perspective, just the whole tracking process, perhaps. Um, and I, I guess maybe I should throw in, too, you know, I mean, to, to me, it's an obvious question, but how much of getting it right on the front end is important versus, oh, I'm going to Photoshop it all on the back end with, with all the technology now, you know? Maybe we could address that, too. Sure. So. I always prefer to have the artist vocalist in the studio with me and cut them because I do have a lot of experience engineering and that creates a lot less work on the back end. Yeah. That being said, during COVID, we shifted to all remote. Mm -hmm. So I tend to go to singers and, vo and artists that are in my roster that I've worked with for years that I know can deliver mm -hmm. good quality recordings. And then when I do find a new artist, it's the same thing. I'm vetting them. I'm hearing a sample of their recordings. And there is quite a lot that I can do to clean it up on the back end. So, you know, I've worked with vocals where there was, you know, the room wasn't treated great and I had to reduce some of the reverb or, you know, just um, there was, it wasn't recorded on a great preamp and I definitely can work with those vocals and get a great sounding final mix. I mean, and how much of it is education as you work with these people, you know, you're educating to how to get a good sound and isolation and all that. I mean, I guess as you keep the relationship going, they learn as well, right? So, Yeah, I mean, I've always impressed with the artists that I work with in that a lot of people know how to get, like, basic engineering skills seem to be pretty common with talented singers, at least in this age with COVID and everything. If they want to work, so I think that's a great lesson. I mean, you got to have those tech chops as well as, as the talent, yeah. Um, cool, uh, Sarah, how about you? Well, I always find that like casting the right people for the album is 90% of it. Honestly, because you don't want to be going back and forth and frustrating a composer and being like, well, this isn't right because of X, Y, Z. I mean, there's only so many notes you can give somebody. So from the get-go, I mean, sometimes I'll even, I remember I would like make the album idea based on somebody who is really good at something, you know? So I think that casting is most of it. And, um, you know, and trusting them, trusting them creatively. Um, also, authenticity is so important. Like, I was working on an album, for, uh, Music from Mexico, and I actually hire people in Mexico, you know, who really live and breathe that music. I mean, it'd be different. Like, I want to I wanna hire people who know that music inside and out. It's part of their culture, you know, especially if it's a world album. That's extremely important. But, um, but for singers and everything else, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Steve. It's like you just know somebody who's going to get it quickly. And, and, and it's going to sound great every time. You don't have to do a lot of hand-holding. So it is about expanding your Rolodex as well. I mean, especially as music evolves, it's like you can't be good at everything, you know? So going to the same composers for every project is a big mistake, I think. Um, and also, like, if I was doing a project myself, even with my own music, 
I would actually trade my drum tracks for someone who is great at the piano, for example. Yeah. Because, I mean, the music is, is 100% like, you know, it, it's got to be good. Because it, it, we have a saturated market right now. Uh, we have for the past 10 years. It's just more and more libraries are popping up. You have to make sure it's good. So I think personnel is number one. Good. And Dave. David, I should I, say. I, I agree 100%. Uh, personnel, and like I said before, you know, planning is huge, but then putting the right people in play is super important. One other trick that is, might sound a little cruel, but um, I learned this from like, one of my favorite bands. Probably it's kind of nerdy, but uh, Steely Dan, right? So they deliberately would you know, record different bands on the same song, and then they would... You know, a guitar player would be like, oh, yeah, I played on that song. And then be like, that's not me. Um, and so I don't exactly do that, but I deliberately mix it up so that it's not the same people every time because, you know, I want to make sure that there's that. They want to make sure that they want to earn the gig every time. And I've always explained, especially I want to hire friends. I want to hire people that I'm, I'm comfortable with and, and personal with because... We're just going to have a better synergy in the studio, but I also want to know that they're going to take it seriously too. So they've got to they've got to prove it every single session, every single song, even though we're friends. Like, and it, and there's been a couple times where you know it's like eh, we got to pick this up a, a notch, you know, and bring your A game. And so I think it's important to work with people that you know, and just like in here, we're building relationships. So much of it is a is a people game, but then putting the right, you know, if I've got 112 guitar players in my phone. I want to pick the right guy for this specific type of, you know, New Orleans blues, rock, you know, whatever the style is. Try to pick the, the right guy for that. And then you're not asking too much of them because they're just going to do their thing. And then it'll just come together, you know. And can I add to that? Um, that's why we did the theme song the way that we did and had different production teams kind of battling it out. Because when you have hungry indie artists that are going against each other, the product is going to be at next level because they know that there's competition. They know that other people are going to be doing the same track. So what am I going to do that's going to make it different? So that's why we do that is because that, that little sense of competition with creatives, it's like big. It's the Lennon and McCartney effect. It just takes the song to the next level. So um, the next, I, I still want to stay on the, the recording part and then we'll jump into mixing and mastering here in a minute. But um, well, first of all, any questions so far? I don't want to leave you guys hanging. Any? I think we have a floater mic. All right, we're good. Um, if you want to get us the more techie stuff, but I think, honestly, this is the most important stuff. So how? Um, let's start from the back this time. So, David, how do you combat overproduction? Um, obviously, in the 48 hours, you probably can't. But uh, how do you combat overproduction? Like, how do you know when it's done, which is a hard thing I always struggle with? And then any... Again, this is a very general question, but anything you're thinking in terms of sync that you're not thinking of as far as like, I'm just making a song, like any things that keep either a song form or a song flow, energy level up and down um, that you're really keeping in mind for any type of sync. I know it's hard to generalize every style, but just those two questions together as a package. Yeah. I just want to make sure my mic's on. Uh, I think thinking about the... Um, this, we talk about genre. Oh, what genre are you going to compose? We're, as musicians, we're thinking about the style of music, but I think it's also important to think, what medium am I writing for? Because I think that's super, super important. If you're, if you're writing a promo, you should know what promos look like, right? Uh, how, what the song forms look like for a promo. And there's different styles. Like sometimes, you know, it might be something that starts with one ostinato and it just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing to like a big climax or maybe it's the kind of promo that's got a lot of stops and cuts for like a sports thing where there's a lot of shots so I think thinking visually when you write is really really important especially like I do a lot of promos so I'm always um, thinking about visually what will this look like you know because you're, it's not right it's not like writing a traditional song like a ABA -A type of song form it's always growing and changing and morphing to fit, you know, that sort of high energy situation. So I think thinking visually, you know, definitely is important. And that instrumentation will then take care of itself. If you know what you're writing for, you're not going to 
you know, throw a hundred instruments in there and overproduce, correct? I mean, oh, that like was when the, you know was when that the stop, original you know? question? I'm sorry. Well, uh, no, I mean, it's all kind of bundled. Together. How do you know when it's done? Uh, yeah. So that's you know, I was I've been kind of asking people all week like, what's quality versus quantity? Yeah. And everyone, I think everyone's gut reaction is to say quality. And it's like, okay, well then write one song a year and see how that how see how that does for you, right? Like at a, and I think one of the hardest things to do, especially as a some for you know younger writers, is to call something done because when you call it done, that means like you're putting it out there, right? And it's hard to take that leap. Whereas if you're like, well, it's almost done, it's easy to it's easy to kind of like put it off versus like really stepping out and owning it. So I think um, you know I, you have to. I, I think if if you think something. You, I think the more you write, the more you kind of feel like, all right, this is this is it, and it's you're ready. And it, if you think you're there, you just move on to the next one, and then, you know, unless you're doing a 48-hour turnaround, that's <laughs> wild. But I I love if, if I can put something away for a week or two, and then come back and and be like, all right, is it still good? Because after a week, I can kind of clear my head from it. Um, certainly, if I'm spending a budget on live musicians, I'm going to make sure I have some buffer time to make sure that I really like everything before I, you know, do final tweaks. I'm going to throw one more in there, and I swear I'll move, move down the line, but uh, templates. Like you said, you're knocking out an uh, Afro-Cuban. Uh, any particular templates that help your workflow, like either a mixing template or you're saying, you know, I'm always just going to do this certain thing? or yeah, it Especially if it's, a, if it's a really unique concept. Um, I, I like to spend a bunch of time at the beginning of the project and just listen to sounds and put together a unique sound palette for that project. So that's not a cookie cutter from the previous one, but I might spend a, a few days, um, literally a few days, just listening through sounds, maybe looking for a, a couple new sound libraries that I haven't tapped into yet. Uh, and just, I build, I call it a sound palette, right? Just like an artist putting together their color scheme, right? So. Um, and then when it's time to write, I'm not, okay, now I need to find a kick drum. I'm gonna spend two hours looking for a kick drum. No, I've got my, I've got my stuff, I've got my kits, I've got my you know, basses lined up, I've got my instruments all in order. Now I can just start writing, and that workflow has yeah. been very helpful. Cool, thank you so much. Okay, so Sarah, any and all of those, you know, address one of them or, or multiple. Um. Uh, yeah, when is it done? Well, I'm a fan of maximizing usage potential which what that means is having it build and have a lot of layers. Um, we, we kind of are living in a STEM uh, music industry right now. Everything needs stems, right? So the only problem, it, th I've never had a problem where there's too many stems. I've had a problem when there's not enough or there's not enough build. So what I always tell composers and the way I try to write is to make sure the full mix has everything someone could possibly need and then do alt mixes. Um, I actually had an editor friend tell me this. It was funny because it changed how I thought about composing. He's like, you know, I, I, I'm a reality TV editor. All I want is the drum and bass stem. That's all I want. And then all these libraries have all these, like, big, huge mixes, which is what, every, what we're told to do, right? right? But meanwhile, this guy just wants the drum and bass mix. He only went to the libraries that had that already done for him. He wasn't going to make it himself with the stems even. So what that told me is... Make, make a mix that actually goes somewhere and has a musical thought to it and has enough layers for an editor to work with and then strip it down and maximize that usage potential, already have those mixes done and mastered because that will really increase the usage of that track. I'm, I'm picturing Pro Tools in my head and I'm thinking, okay, so that's, ver that's vertically, you know, like the stems, how many tracks and then combinations of tracks. What about horizontally? Like, do you say this needs like five different musical ideas or five different sections or four or three? Are there any general rules you follow there or a minimum of, of two different ideas or not really? Well, it depends on what kind of what kind of style it is. So if it's an orchestral, it'd be nice to have woodwinds and strings and things like that, right? Uh, a pop track, even a hip hop track, you know, less is more sometimes with hip hop, we all know this, right? Um, but it is nice to have more melody if you can do it and then do like an underscore version and then a bed version, right? To where, you know, you have the full thought. Um, vocals are always a good idea too if you're doing hip hop. 
um, and then make sure that the instrumental version can stand by itself, especially sonically, to where you know the vocal usually takes up a lot in hip hop, and when you take it out, there's this empty sounding, unusable instrumental. So I think it's important to look at like, well, what kind of mixes are going to be placed, and what will maximize that usage potential? Maybe doing the instrumental, adding a melody when the uh, in the instrumental version, having like an alternate version that way, is a way to maximize the usage potential. And, but just also having, like my friend said, the drum bass mix, which yeah. killed my spirit after uh, working so hard on these big mixes, you know. But I mean, it's important to kind of satisfy everything, and you can maximize potential with just one track doing that. Great. Thank you so much. And Steve, all of the above, you know. Talk yeah, to <laughs> I agree with everything they said. Um, one additional thing, when working with vocals and lyrics, I would always suggest um, not using explicit language, or if there is, making sure that the song makes sense in a clean edit so that there's not too much explicit language. That definitely helps maximize usage. Yeah. And yes, it's important for, the, for there to be a development and for the track to move and kind of would be able to push through a scene visually cool. as well, yeah. Okay. Money. Um, so for custom work, of course, we don't know what's done until the client says it's done. Um, so that's that's the answer to that one. Um, but for like stuff that we do on purpose, like we do sync camps in different places and different states, and we take briefs that I've had for the last couple months and figure out trends, and then we give people guidelines on how to make this song make sense, and you know, and what kind what kind of language, like you said, they should use, what what subjects they should use terms they should all this stuff we give it to them like in an educational process so that they can make good sync music um making sync music you definitely need to have um those stops those goes you it has to make sense um so like last time we did it it was for sports and big stadium sounding songs so that already has its format and we're just following that format and creating sound recordings that are actually going to get placements because they're already going after that type of sound. So knowing when that's done is, as she said, knowing what alts you have, knowing that the track can stand alone. There's no production that we have during our sync camps that the track can't stand alone by itself. And that's on purpose, because we want to raise the usage possibility. So. But knowing when something's done, honestly, is whenever you feel like, you know what, I can't do more to this to make this be better, you know? And sometimes that's a hard decision, but in reality, sometimes you have to realize that sometimes music is just a job sometimes. Music is just getting to the point, getting to the brief, what's my next one? So speaking to that, and, and again, well, let's work this way, or maybe you just wanna, we just wanna jump in at this point. Um, how much are you chasing temp tracks versus straight original? I'm just curious, because we're all kind of producers. You know, the client gives you the temp track. How much are you, the, how much, how do you, how do you navigate that line between if the client gives you a temp track and still being original? Let's, let's ask it that way. Steve. I think it's important to match the energy, the vibe, the sentiment, and the tempo. And then I would suggest completely not trying to copy the temp track at all. But those things are what it is that the client generally likes about the track in the first place. The tempo's important because it's probably already synced into a, or it could be synced in to, a, a, to the video. And then, you know, the, the energy and what the piece of music conveys is important because that's what they're looking for. But, by all means, I'm always trying to not copy the chord changes, not copy the style of singing, not copy the instrumentation exactly, anything like that. Anybody but else? You do have to focus, I'm sorry, but you do have to focus on, like if I get a brief and they give me three, four temp tracks, I'm gonna realize in the instrumentation, what's making them go toward this style of music? It might be the same type of hi-hat. It might be the same clapping that's in all three tracks, you know? And then from there, you're like, okay, they want claps. 
they want something that they can afford that has claps. So <laughs> then Absolutely. I go <laughs> and then find something that they can afford that has claps. So Yeah, it's always great when you have more than one ref track because then you can figure out, dissect what it is that's the thread that goes through all of those. And for sure, you definitely want to include that. I think that. it's the clave, so we just figured that, that out. Is the clave. So. <laughs> Any, anybody else just working with uh, client expectations? And then I guess the next level is how much do we expect the client to speak our language and then interpreting really what they want. You know, they might say, I like this, and they like the melody, but it's actually the claps they like. So how about navigating that? Any other advice there? I've got some epic email threads, you know, like just... I, and I kind of like it, but it's also very, it can get really frustrating too. But just being patient with that process of like, we're just trying to get to what's going to work and what's going to land because, so, you know, often there's a lot of back and forth of just trying to figure out, you know, communicating between a, a video person and a musician. It, it's, again, trying, I think trying to think visually can help. But then looking, like you said, looking at the elements, what are the common elements? Is it the tempo? Is it the energy? instrumentation but then I try not to listen uh, too much to the to the reference because then you're it, too I want to do my own thing but so I try to get away from that as quick as I can once I've got the vibe figured out yeah, I think we all are talking the same language finding that pulse whatever is making it tick and then yeah doing our own thing okay I'm gonna get a little any questions so far yeah we have one there it, Uh, this question is for Steve. So I um, loved hearing that uh, you, you produce about 20 albums a year. I found that really impressive. And I wanted to know, what does that look like practically in terms of a schedule? Like, is that two and a half weeks per album with a, you know, going hell for leather? Is it three at the same time over, over a month? Or I'd love to hear just practically to, to hear in detail how that's broken down and how that works. Absolutely. It does depend on the genre and the style of music because some music is more complicated, more dense. If I'm doing a trailer hip hop album, there'll be a lot of sound design involved and sometimes I'll spend maybe two or three times the amount of time I would spend on just a rap album, current music, or whatever. So generally I like to work on one album at a time and it just looks like me all day making music. <laughs> Again, you find yourself back in a dark room for 14 hours a day. It's strange, right? It's all, it comes back around. A little more sunlight in this, this my current setup. But. There you go. Good, good. good question. Yeah. One back there, yeah. Yeah. You go, go ahead, go ahead. Are you guys running uh, different uh, language versions of songs? Uh, I guess is the first part of the question. And then this, the second part is, if so, are the... Are those translations uh, work for hires, or are they taking writer credit? We're doing English and Latin and like several different languages, or? I don't really do a lot of alts um, in with languages for like our catalog stuff, like that our own IP that we do at the sync um, sync camps. But I probably because we're supposed to be doing like a Latin R and B and Latin pop in Miami. Um, in November, more than likely, I'm probably going to have them do like an English version too. And if I do have them do an English version, then it'll all be in composite of the same type of sync deal. So, so the, the people that would translate that, they would be, they would take writer credit or that would be work for hire? Uh, um, no. So we don't do a lot of work for hire. We try to make sure that all of our composers and writers get paid and then um, the work for hire that we do do is like it's more so buyouts because of theme songs and stuff like that so the production company has to own it so they can do whatever they want to do with it we'll still get writer share so work for hires aren't the devil guys like it actually really helps a lot in certain situations especially like catalog work production music library work or you know we did some stuff for Viacom music library that they're doing now and that was a work for hire but the writer share in the back end, it makes a lot of sense. And we had one over here. And you'll have to forgive us because we don't have monitors here, so it's yep. a little bit harder for us to hear, but hopefully we can understand. Definitely a lot of... Really hard can to you hear. hear. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. Um, for, for Steve, I wanted to ask you about, um, you said 20 different albums. I'm just curious about the range of genres 
that you worked in? Yeah, so I've done a lot of different genres. My wheelhouse is definitely current pop and hip hop. So that is what I'm cranking out the most. I've also done a lot of underscore and crime and also basically whatever we need to fill out the library. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I'm working in current pop and hip hop styles. Okay, I mean, I was just curious because I wanted people to know that it's okay for them to not just have to focus just on one style. You know, that Absolutely. It's, yeah. I think you should focus on whatever brings you joy. Right. Exactly. One in the back. I've got a question for David. Um, when you're working with larger groups, bringing session musicians in on sessions, how often are you able to recoup costs from libraries that you're working with, or how often are you coming out of pocket to bring musicians in on a project? Uh, most of the time that that's happening, I've got a budget. Uh, in, but there have definitely been projects that I just think it's a great idea, and I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Um, so I try to spend, you know, not too much. But I, I will say I'm always willing to sacrifice some budget to do what I want to do because I believe in my tracks. So I believe that I'll make it up on the back end. So if I spend, if I end up spending a little bit more than what I was hoping, it's worth it because I really believe in taking care of my musicians. So I would never, you know, try to shortchange the musicians who are, who are not going to get any back end, right? They're, they're work for hire. So I always want to really honor the players that are so good. So if it takes a little bit longer, and they feel like they really need another take, and it's going to take a few more minutes, or you know, I'm happy to do that because you know I, I'm I'm okay with that. But I, I guess a, a shorter answer would be I try to spend, like, uh, I don't know, about I try to keep I try to keep about sixty to seventy five percent of my budget as my income, and then the rest I'm I usually will kind of allocate that as. Um, you know, for live stuff is kind of what it works out. But like I said, in a lot of cases, I'm, I'm negotiating a budget and we kind of have in mind about how much it's going to cost to do live brass or something like that. So. All right, we have, a, yeah, another question over here. Hey, thank you guys. Really appreciate you guys being up here. Um, so my question is for Imani. Um, so with you being a music supervisor and, and kind of doing some of that as well, um, if somebody were to approach you to try to maybe work with you, like what's, what's something that's going to just turn you off and just be like, you don't know what you're doing, I'm just moving on, you know? And then what's, what's a way that's going to... What are my turn-offs? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are in a different world today, sir. But um, for me... I I really don't like, um, it got real quiet in here. Everybody's like really listening super intensely. <laughs> but for me, I really don't like when someone um, is just trying to sell themselves so much um, and can't answer certain questions like, oh, like, how are you in the producer's relationship? Do you produce your own self? Or if they use words like PROs in a way that it's supposed to impress me, I'm like, okay, great, you have ASCAP, so I have BMI, thanks, great. Like, that's a great conversation, like stuff like that. Cause then it kind of puts red flags that's like, okay, they're new. Um, but if they are new and they just come up to me openly like, hey, I'm new to this, I'm just trying to work and see if I can get into this type of situation, then I'm more open and inclined to be like, let me kind of teach you because I needed that when I was starting off. I needed to understand how sync agent agreements work, does it make sense for me, what should I stay away from? Um, or even if they said they licensed their tracks, that is an X for me. Any licensed tracks, and unfortunately Splice, I do not deal with, um, just because I've had an, a terrible experience with Splice before. Um, 
So I don't deal with splice or stuff like that. But I tell people, I don't just be like cold and say, no, we can't deal with your music. Like when people submit, I have open submissions on my Instagram, Blaze, UNLTD. Um, and people submit all the time, composers submit all the time, and we actually talk and speak to each person that submits. And we tell them why we didn't add them on. If it was a producer that just sent me random tracks, we don't represent instrumentals. But if you want to get into more custom work stuff, we can put you on our custom work list um, once we review your music, stuff like that. Um, but other than that, for me, it's just like, be yourself. Please don't feel like because you reached out to me four or five times and I didn't respond, I'm ignoring you. I'm busy, but at the same time, I try to make sure my colleagues, because I have two people underneath me, go through the submissions every every couple of weeks just so that we can make sure we stay on top of it and we stay active. So that's basically my turnoffs when it comes to people. But me supervising, I usually use my catalog a lot or I'll use like PMLs like APM or Extreme and I, I use them to kind of like fill in the holes that I don't have in my catalog. Thank you. Right, well, uh, once again, thank you so much for, for being here. Sarah, this is a question for you. You mentioned trading out services. I'm hearing, you know, budgets and all of this, and it's like, wow, I'm just a dude in a room over a garage, and I don't have anything like a budget. Do you think trading out services is uh, the best strategy to get live players, or would you ever entertain giving up some of your writer's share just so you can have a live string player or a cello player or something on your track? Oh, yeah, I, I should probably specify, like, when I was trading out services, I gave them charts. Um, so I went to Berkeley, so I'd write parts for them. I would never ask. I, I would always give, um, you know, composer share for someone who wrote something. Um, so I'm just talking about, like, session work, right? So I want, that's, that's a good distinction to make. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I, you know, being a rock drummer and being in bands, I just made a lot of friends over the years. You know, you'd open up for bands or vice versa, and you just got to know everybody. And we all were broke, and, and you know, some of that never goes away. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I think deep down, I'll always feel like I'm that broke musician. But, like, you know, it's just a way to help each other. I think it's a, a healthy community uh, to help each other and to support each other emotionally, too. I think that's very important. So... But yeah, I also co-write with people too, which I find, you know, a lot of times just realizing that you can't do it all and knowing that someone's, um, someone's musical statement will make the track better. I mean, you know, I, I love co-writing with people. I, th I think it's important for us to be a community and, and be supportive of each other in any way we can. But yeah, as a drummer, I guess it's easier because they don't give me charts. I kind of wish they would, but uh, they don't give me charts. But I'm happy to help, you know, and then it's like, oh man, I need a great guitar track on this and I'm crappy at the guitar. So, you know, but again, I would hand them a chart and uh, give them the key changes and what I needed to, you know, be simple. But, but if I wanted someone to like shred, like Eddie Van Halen, yes, I'd give them writer's share for that. And, and when, just a, a quick follow-up. When you do those, those trade-outs, do you have, like, paperwork, like, work yes. for hire, and that way Always. things are all straight? Yeah, of course, because, you know, um, I think it's very important to any catalog you're working with that everything's secure and no one's going to come back around or, f like, a fight happens, you know, um, and it, it's it's definitely required, like with uh, when you're signing your your stuff to a catalog or anything else, they want to see that paperwork. So it's good to just get a boiler template thing. And you know, we all know, like I'm never surprised when someone hands me a work for hire thing if they're just hiring me for to be a drummer. It's like I gladly sign that. It's not offensive in any kind of way. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question, and we got a wrap for the next panel. One over there. Yeah. Hey, uh, this question is kind of coming from the studio side, but do any of you ever encounter unions? And if so, how do you work with that? Is it a little different, or do you just try to avoid them? Um, so I only had one encounter with the union, and that was because um, of Warner Brothers. We were doing um, the Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow thing. No, that was... Oh my gosh, this is when you know you've done too many placements. That was a different song. Um, but nevertheless, um, I learned a lot during that process because we had to basically say when we were in the studio, what time, when we were working, all of the all of the details. Because she did like a run, she basically sweetened the song. So we got like double the amount of the money that we were supposed to get in the first place. It became a bag when it really was supposed to be like fifteen hundred dollars. It was really weird. But but I was just like, oh okay, this is what it's like dealing with 
the union, like, they really take care of, like, their artists and stuff like that. Even though my artist wasn't a part of the union because the studio itself was unionized, they had to handle her in the same aspect. But that's the only... I, I was going to say, in Nashville's a wor- uh, right-to-work state, which basically means you could you could be a session musician, play a uh, union date in the morning, and play a off-the-card date in the afternoon, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. So it that's why there's a lot of you know, work going to Nashville for that purpose. A lot of production music, too. Anybody else? Well, production music um, has to be non-union. So, um, personally, from the library side, we don't work with unionized tracks. So, um, it's very important that it's not union, honestly. So, uh, because, you know, think about it. It's like if you have music on a search engine, someone at an ad agency can just grab that track and put it in an edit, and you wouldn't know the difference until they send you the money, and then they could you don't want to lose clients doing that. So it's important from the library side to have it be non-union. All right, guys. Again, I'd like to thank our panel. Let's give them a hand.